Hello and welcome to the next episode of our webinar series hosted by Vic No Till, focusing on relevant issues around soil carbon through a closer look at strategies to increase soil organic matter. This project is supported by Wimmera CMA through funding from the Australian Government National Land Care Program. We'd like to thank them very much for their support. For those that missed last week's webinar with Graham uh, on um, on grazing, we will have it recorded and it's available on our YouTube channel. Uh, today, we're fortunate enough to be joined by David Hardwick. David is an agroecologist and has over 20 years experience in rural landscapes, farming and food systems. He develops and delivers many of the extension projects for soil, land, food across Australia. He's worked in community development and then horticulture before completing a dairy train, traineeship on an organic dairy in New South Wales. Since then, he's had a wide ranging career working both in management and technical roles. These include land care, land care extension, agronomy, soils, agribusiness, biofertilizer, R&D and manufacturing, organics, training and consulting positions. David's passion is agroecology and empowering farmers with knowledge and skills that make a difference. So welcome, David. Oh, thanks very much, Dan. Thanks for having us along. Uh, no worries. Part of uh, the session today, we're, uh, we're really keen to make it as interactive as possible. Um, so if you've got any questions for David as we go, if you can type them into your, um, your Q&A box down the bottom, um, and we'll try and separate the questions from the, the general comments. Um, if you've got any general comments, if you can put them in your chat, in the chat box rather than the Q&A, um, and we'll, we'll address them as, or David will address them as we go. So. Um, so yeah, without further ado, I'd like to welcome, welcome David to the webinar. Thanks, Dan. I'll get my screen set up and we'll uh, we'll jump into it. Uh, welcome everyone. Yeah, thanks for joining us for this uh, on farm bugs and brews topic. Uh, properly, formally, we better call them bioferments and biostimulants, biofertilizers, the whole range of different kinds of uh, biological products that uh, you can make on farm or you can make them, uh, you can buy them obviously off the shelf commercially, but yeah, there's lots of opportunities to make quality products on farm um, and uh, help build your own resilience in your farming system. Um, I just thought I'd start off with this picture here in Thailand. My uh, wife is Thai, so I have a big Thai uh, family and we go there every year and my uh, mother-in-law, who's pretty elderly now, but she's still into a garden, which is not very big as you can see, but all of those bottles in the front of the house there on the porch are all uh, little biofertilizers that she makes up because there's a whole tradition in Thailand, uh, yeah, of making different ferments and brews and spraying them on plants. And that, yeah, it's been around for a fair, fairly long time. Um, and they're, they're pretty simply made. You just uh, put a few veggie scraps in a bottle with a little bit of molasses and water and leave it and it turns into something that you can use. So obviously this whole biological thing is pretty widespread. Uh, here's a here's a um, farm in southern New South Wales, Brendan's place. Um, I think he's watching at the moment, and yeah, obviously different scale, different recipes, but trying to get the same thing, trying to improve soils and plant health so that we get better crops and pastures, and um, yeah, and, and build resilience into our um, farming systems, if you like, into our agronomy. Um, oh, this uh, just to give you a little bit of background of me with a story. Uh, this was a uh, a trial that the company I used to work for in the 2000s called Ozmin, which is no longer around the company, and I won't go down that story. But um, yeah, we, I, my job was the R and D manager for the company, and it made different biological products and rock phosphate products. So one of the things I was supposed to do was trial if they worked or not, uh, and I actually. We paid University of New England there in Armidale to actually do a fairly major sort of six month pot trial on our compost tea based product, which is kind of like a sleeper tea we used to call it, like it was, we'd stabilise it and then sell it in a bottle to farmers across Eastern Australia. So yeah, we spent quite a lot of money and we had a master student doing it and I had the, the, um, the, the researcher at the uni helped me out and they set it all up for me. And yeah, that was a uh, six month project in 2008 and it was a very interesting one because the compost tea uh, there was fertil high fertilizers there was no fertilizers there was compost tea plus fertilizers and and some other biological products as well mind you we did trial some other 
commercial type products, carboxylic acids and stuff. Uh, and then there was kind of compost tea on its own or biological treatment on its own. And the really interesting thing with the tomato trial, we did wheat and tomatoes in the trial, um, was that uh, tomatoes can get a problem called blossom end rot, which is where the end of the fruit rots away with a, with a fungal disease and it's down to calcium, lack of calcium. So it's a known, quite a common disease in tomatoes when you don't give them enough calcium. Uh, and so the trial design, we deliberately put extra calcium or lime in the pots to make sure that wasn't going to be a problem in the trial. And yet it still came up as especially in the high MPK uh, pots, but it didn't manifest itself in where the biological treatments were going. So definitely a really interesting trial and it kind of showed me, uh, really opened the door to me that fact that this, you know, improving the biological status of the soil and the plant um, can really help uh, trigger nutrient cycling, improve that, but also uh, plant health and disease resistance as well. So what exactly was the mechanism and why our product did the job? Well, I couldn't give you the direct answer, but now we've got a lot more science around it and we can probably guess. By the way, because I'm on one screen, I'm on the road, that's why you're seeing the sidebar, so I do apologise for that. Um, and so, yeah, what, what am I going to cover off this morning? in this morning session is um, just yeah, reflect on what we're actually trying to do here with these biological products that we're making or buying. Here's my mate Luke Harrington um, on, on the job, just showing people a few of the different commercial options there near Cowra on a field day. But yeah, what are we actually trying to do um, as we're doing uh, this, all these products, we're making them, and then what are we actually trying to achieve? The different types of products that are out there, uh, the different technologies. So just a quick summary of the three different main technologies to making these products. Uh, and then just, yeah, quickly how they work, and then I was just going to jump into the essentials around on-farm culturing. So that's obviously brewing up microbial type products. Uh, and then the on-farm chelation, just touching on that. Um, yeah, just briefly, chelation is another kind of key technology that uh, some farmers, some of you might be trying to do as well. Some people do. And then touch on a few basic recipes. Now, there's lots of recipes out there on YouTube and in the world of regenerative ag. So I'm just going to touch on a couple that we put together in a booklet. But, um, yeah, you um, you may have uh, uh, some other ones that you're using and that's all good. But I guess there's some principles to the recipes, storage and handling, using them. I won't touch on that too much today because it's its own topic really. So probably, you know, for another day or in uh, some of you already in groups sort of working on that side of it. But yeah, just some basics around using them and monitoring them. So I'll better jump into it. Um, and so I guess before we start, I think we better just get our, uh, get a reality check. And that is that plants have been evolving for hundreds of millions of years and they have evolved ways and adapted themselves to optimize their own nutrition. So I'm sorry if you're an agronomist and you thought that they were waiting for you to come along and tell them how to grow and take up their nutrients. But plants have actually been evolving for hundreds of millions of years and they have evolved really subtle, complex ways to optimize their nutrition. And yes, I'm sure most of you are familiar with a lot of those ways and strategies they use rely on partnering up with microbes. So that's the first thing. We've just got to remember that if we give plants a chance and provide them with a good conditions and environment and soil health, then they actually can, to a great extent, optimize their own nutrition, um, even in an agricultural paddock, which is pretty disturbed. Um, I guess the second thing to remember, just for that little bit of a reality check when we're doing agronomy, is that plants through those hundreds of millions of years of evolution have actually developed a multi-layered dynamic defense system. And that's not a quote from me, that's a quote from a scientific paper I've just been brushing up on around plant health and all the, the complex biochemistry behind it. 
but basically <clears throat> plants have developed a multi-layered dynamic defense system. Otherwise they wouldn't have got so far along the evolutionary journey. So that, that defense system is complex. There's different layers to it. There's primary defenses and secondary induced defenses and systemic responses. There's a whole lot of stuff that's all complex, but the bottom line is that they can help themselves if you like. They can't run away like we can, but they can fight and they, they do fight and they are quite um, well adapted um, if you give them a chance. And the third really important thing I think we need to remember here um, as we're talking about plants is the fact that over those hundreds of millions of years, they have also developed adaptations to manage environmental stress. So that's things like drought and salinity and cold periods and they actually do have lots of ways that they deal with that and bounce back. So um, the key thing is though that if the plant isn't hasn't got full nutrition and it hasn't got a really good community of microbes that it's in close partnership with, then the, it can't express its full genetic and phenotypic uh, expression if you like to do all those things that it's evolved to do. Um, so I guess if we think about agronomy, we're really managing a soil plant system to grow crops and pastures. Uh, and that means we're managing nutrition, we're managing genetics, and we're managing microbes. Um, and usually in conventional agronomy, we're managing soluble nutrient elements, and usually only a couple of them, NPK, um, in really, really conventional agronomy, um, 20th century ag agronomy. Um, genes, we're kind of worried about breeding for, you know, disease resistance or some traits, usually production traits. Uh, and uh, then we've got obviously the microbes and we often focus on the pathogens, the ones that cause us diseases. So, um, you know, that's usually what we do. Uh, and then obviously we're trying to manage the environment for the plants. So that's the soil conditions, you know, moisture and obviously temperature. So they're the kind of, that's the kind of current, uh, sort of environment or system that we're managing. But if we take a more 21st century perspective, we might call it regenerative or ecological perspective, then we've got to realize that nutrition is more than just nutrient elements. It's also all these growth factors and other biomolecules that plants need, like we need vitamins um, and enzymes. So it's that. The second thing is that genes is more than just those simple inheritance genes of Men Mendelian uh, genetics. Um, it's also epigenetics that the plant switching on and off genes and depending on uh, environment and nutritional status. Uh, and there's lots of complex interactions between genes and, and genetic expression that we're only just starting to understand. And finally, obviously, when we're managing microbes, uh, it's all about those complex beneficial interactions. And that's really what we're trying to enhance, not just deal with the negatives, we're trying to manage the positives and it's really complex. So uh, in a nutshell, that's really the difference, I guess, uh, between the different types of agronomy. And so what we're trying to do now in 21st century agronomy, here's Brendan here out in the paddock, checking out the soil. What we're trying to do is um, optimize plant growth, which is agronomy 101, and that's quantity and quality. And the second thing we're trying to do is optimize plant health and obviously that's defense plant having a defense system and plants having an ability to manage its stress um, and so really if we focus in on these biological products and why and how we're using them it's usually one of two main things and that is to enhance our soil environment improve the root zone for the plants and that has this flow on of you know these other specific reasons of improving nutrient cycling and uptake of nutrients, decomposing organic matter, uh, improving soil structure, biocontrol of diseases, but also the other one that, you know, when we're adding stimulants and things to the soil is, or microbials, we, we may be trying to trigger phenotypical expression of beneficial plant traits, which in plain English means we're trying to get the plants to turn on important genes for stress and, and health. So plants can turn on and off genes in depending on the uh, stimulants they get from the root zone microbes and conditions. So we're trying to trigger that. So that's one, one area that we try to manage with our biological stuff. And the second one is we're trying to 
optimize root and shoot growth. So obviously above ground, we want to optimize root and shoot growth uh, and reduce plant stress. So um, we want to reduce plant stress and improve plant defenses. So we're trying to do that above ground uh, and below ground. Obviously, we're trying to work on the soil. So we have these new tools in the toolbox to do that, and that's these biological products. And this is, I guess, the exciting part of 21st century agronomy. Um, so in a nutshell, we're trying to enhance the beneficial microbial processes in the soil plant system. And we call that whole community of microbes on the leaves and in the soil and all around the plant and in the plant as well, half in the plant, all the endophytes and stuff. We call that whole thing, or I call it the paddock microbiome. So I'm pretty sure most of you'd be happy with that term. And we're trying to enhance that microbiome, paddock microbiome. And the second thing we're trying to do is optimize the beneficial biomolecules in the soil plant system. So that's not just the nutrient elements, but all of these other compounds like enzymes, growth factors, um, hormones, signaling molecules, there's so many of them out there. There's a whole new world of it. And in fact, one of the terms used for this stuff is uh, metabolome, so uh, which are like kind of small, low molecular weight um, biomolecules that exist in nature, in, in, in living tissues and stuff. So we're trying to optimize that. And, and so we're either helping microbes, encouraging microbes to get the beneficial guys going or the plants themselves to trigger that. So that's the sort of second thing we're trying to do, work on those two dimensions, not just the nutrient element dimension that often 20th century agronomy focuses on. And finally, there's another use for these products that I'm, we're about to explore a little bit, and that is we can use them to manage composting. So here's uh, Wes uh, Spencer's place at Katapna, where he's making compost with a uh, fermentation minimum turn system. Uh, and yeah, you can sort of see uh, he's using the inoculums to help him manage the compost process, but we can also use them for things like effluent, shed manures and stuff like that. Um, we use them at home for our toilet, so you, know, you can use them for a whole range of things basically. Um, so let's quickly have a look at the types of products that are out there. There's a few, it can seem a bit overwhelming when you're looking at all the biological products now on the market, but they actually fall down into three main types. And the first one is um, your inoculants. And your inoculants are basically uh, those products where you're adding living microbes usually. So here's some commercial examples like Bayer's Serenade product, which is a bacillus bacteria that tries to that you put out and supposed to stimulate the root zone. And then you've got Green Riz, the, the um, inoculum rhizobia for legumes um, from green microbes and Chandra. And then you've obviously got, this is Bob Bright, who's a farmer in North Queensland been doing bioferments and, um, and uh, native microorganisms and all that kind of stuff for a long time on his bananas and his tropical fruits. Um, I call him Cha-Ching cha -ching Farmer because every time he harvests a tropical fruit, yeah, there's dollars in the bank. They're pretty lucrative. But yeah, Bob's been making, uh, went to South America with Mass Humus, has been making a lot of different cultures that he adds to his orchard uh, in under as under canopy or on the, on, the, on the leaves of the crops, the tree crops. So yeah, you've got the products where you're adding a bacteria or fungi to the system or a group of them to the system. And the whole idea is to enhance the micro biome in one way or another. The second um, type of products, group of products that are out there is the stimulants. So these are products where you add those biomolecules in some way, shape or form that either enhance or improve plant physiology or they stimulate the soil microbiome to kind of function better. They're often used for stress and disease in plant management that's often the, the main place for these tools but yeah there's some other reasons people use them as well so you know here's three commercial versions uh tmag the k a humate type product that's one from omnia and then obviously seaweed based products so they're all known to be stimulant type products um, um, that can enhance our crop soil system. Now, there's obviously some really interesting farm-made ferment-based products that are no, that have definitely been shown both scientifically and in the paddock to have stimulatory effects. So enhancing plant 
health and or stress defense systems. Um, that's pretty clear now from both the science and also from farmers getting some results with them. Uh, and then the final type of product that's out there is obviously the biofertilizers. Uh, and the biofertilizers are basically nutrients that have been complexed or bound to carbon usually. So chelated is the other term we use. Um, and so we're binding the nutrient element to a carbon compound usually. And so, and that can include kind of uh, citric acid as a chelator, or it can be biologically fermented like that, uh, or amino acid one, like the one on the right from organic crop protectants, which is a fairly high nitrogen amino complex magnesium example. And on the left here, we've got a biofermin in our cane, some cane farmers that Mackay, the Adard brothers are doing on farm. So, you know, there's different ways to make them, but a biofertilizer, you're putting out nutrients, so the major nutrients or trace elements. And this is one of the challenges of biofertilizers of, of trying to chelate or complex nutrients is uh, there's a you know it can be quite uh, tricky if you like to get a really effective uh, efficient chelation especially biologically because there's so many things going on in the brew so that's the challenge we have is sorting that out so we can be more efficient uh, and finally you'll get products that do more than one thing they might have stimulants they might have microbes in them they might be an all-in-one like compost there on the left but also um, something like a worm juice. So there's a, a worm juice company, Biocast, up in uh, central north, north coast, mid north coast of New South Wales. Um, righto. So I guess you know that sort of the, you've got those three main product types, and biofertilizers. Obviously, you're trying to add nutrients uh, in an effective, really uh, bioavailable way. The second main group is your stimulants that are usually to enhance plant physiology. That's the main reason. So that's defense and stress management usually. Uh, and then the third one is the um, uh, inoculants where we're trying to actually improve the, the microbiome of the paddock. So there's different technologies for doing it basically. So I just really want to quickly touch on that before we jump into the biofertilizers, bioferment technology. Um, so you've got your aerobic culturing and that's really where we um, use a lot of oxygen. So usually pumps and bubbles and lots of troubles. No, I'm just kidding. Just pumps and bubbles. This is the Smart Bug Brewer in use here. There's a company in North Queensland, a couple of farmers. And yeah, you're just adding oxygen You might be, and you're adding microbes and a food source and you're, you're brewing up your target inoculant. Um, and so here's some guys on the tropical fruit orchard there. That's Warren. Um, they do regular programs. Uh, and then we've got fermentation culturing uh, and fermentation culturing, obviously, which is probably the most popular technology because it is quite relatively low labor and a bit easier because you sort of set it and forget it. Um, but yeah, fermentation culturing um, is that's on Fraser's place um, is quite an easy way to do it. That's a no oxygen technique where obviously we're fermenting to achieve different outcomes. Um, and finally, we've got vermiculture. And vermiculture is obviously where you're using worms to create either castings or various liquid extract products. And this is Nutrisoil um, down at Wodonga near my home, Aubrey. Okay, so I guess finally, before we jump into the recipes, that if we just think about how these things work, so they are just to sum it up, the different modes of action, they either deliver nutrients in a really bioavailable form, so they enhance the uptake of nutrients to the plant, whether it's trace elements or major nutrients, they positive in, positively influence plant physiology, so that's helping induce stress and or health genetics and um, biomolecules in the plant so that it, it turns on health and stress genes and actually helps itself uh, and modifies the other thing we're doing is actually modifying the plant microbiome or the soil microbiome by adding beneficial bacterial fungi that actually can change that community for the better uh, leading to a better outcome for us so that's really how all of these things work one or the other so i guess it's really important to be clear when you're making things or trying to use biologicals is what you're actually trying to achieve. What am I trying to achieve here? Am I trying to improve plant health or, or stress management or am I trying to help with nutrient uptake? Just being really clear of what your objectives are helps you then decide on what, what, the, best, um, what the best approach to take is. 
Uh, and then you've got, um, so bef now what I want to do now is jump into on-farm production. So like making the bioferments and stimulants on-farm and just touch on some of the recipes uh, and uh, yeah, go through that. But before we start that, I thought I'd just sort of highlight the fact that basically when you get go down this path and we had a, had a really good workshop in South Australia with the group over there with Steve and Tom and those other guys and, you know, they're, the guys in that group in South Australia are already well down the path of really working a lot of this stuff out for themselves and we're all still learning a lot for sure. Um, but basically what I realised and I've realised it for myself over the years is you've kind of got to master a few different or get your head around a few different trades. It's a bit like when you do a home building job, you've got to kind of be a little bit of a plumber, a bit of a carpenter, a bit of a roofer, etc. So it's the same really with this. And I know farming is already a multi-trade game. You already got to be a jack of quite a few different trades. Um, but yeah, when you go down this biological path, you've got a few more that you've got to throw into your repertoire. And I just thought I'd have put a quote there that's actually attributed. Well, it, it was supposed to be a description of William Shakespeare, the, the famous playwright who was called a jack of all trades, but a is a master of none, but I think someone tacked on the end of that later on. Um, but it's often best times to be uh, off, but oft times better than a master of one. So what they was sort of saying is, yeah, it's not too bad to be a jack of all trades. You can be a, be a bit of a generalist, but yeah, for this kind of stuff, you've got to kind of master or get your head around a few different trades. And the first one is microbiology and culturing microbes. And there are some rules to that. There's some basic rules or principles to follow so you've got to kind of build your skills and your knowledge base around some of those basics of culturing you know and i'll go over a couple of them in a minute the second kind of trade i guess uh, is inorganic chemistry and if you're wondering why i put a picture of the great the ocean up there the coral sea near the great barrier reef it's just because i couldn't think of anything else that sort of shows lots of uh, soluble nutrients <laughs> in water and it was just I had a nice holiday there when I was up doing some cane extension before COVID but yeah you've got to get your head around a little bit around soluble chemi soluble inorganic chemistry so dissolving nutrients in water and there's a few basic rules obviously around solubility rules and com compatibility rules too not that you you always want to be doing soluble and nutrients when you fertilizers but often you have to dissolve things before you chelate them, for example, um, or dissolve them before you get the microbes to eat them and all those kind of things. So just having a bit of an understanding of that's important. Uh, the third kind of trade to think about is organic chemistry, which is chelation. Uh, and um, yeah, there's a couple of, again, some basic principles and rules. And once you get your head around them, it, it'll probably make your chelation uh, uh, efforts more effective uh, and finally uh, plant physiology you know and that's what we're all kind of um, really trying to pick our skills up in you know how what plants what nutrients to plant needs what what are the stages of plant physiology you know your primary primary metabolism and your secondary metabolism all of those things carbohydrates protein synthesis we're trying to get ahead around them because having a bit of a basic understanding of them helps us to to manage them better and make decisions around how we're supporting them with these biological and nutrient products that we're making. Um, so yeah, with that in mind, um, and some of you will be more or less confident on some of those different trades, but I guess it's just think about think about those trades and, and how you can build your skills in them is probably really important. Um, and I think it's the same for professional agronomists and people like myself, we've all got to build it up. And so I've been lucky to have Dr. Chandra Iyer as a sort of support and a friend and helped me over the last sort of 10 years in this because I was pretty green back in the day when we were doing those tomato trials, that's for sure. So let's just quickly look at some of the essentials around culturing on farm. So this is uh, the Atone Brothers, pineapple growers and cane in North Queensland that are pretty good on their compostees, just showing how they do it. Um, but basically, you know, it's about getting the balance right with this culturing. So if you're trying to grow a specific individual or group of microbes, then, you know, it's about getting the balance right. And that balance is really... Um, having a starter-based culture, being really clear, is it kind of, is it a lacto culture, is a, a scrub litter culture out of the, the bush, out of the litter in the bush, uh, and then feeding that culture um, a balance of energy and nutrients, uh, and then giving it water, air, and temperature that suits it as a culture. And this can be the tricky thing because, for example, if you get 
say if you get a native microorganisms culture out of the scrub, out of the litter in the scrub, and then you culture it up with some um, some food sources of some kind, you're actually going to be changing the culture as you feed it. If you just give it a specific type of substrate or food source, you can actually shift what sort of grows. And so it might not be the same at the end as it was when you got it out of the bush. So we just got to think through those kind of things, I guess, is important when we're culturing. <coughs> um, with chelation, so chelation is obviously where you get nutrients or trace elements and you um, want to get them into a carbon stable form so that they're bioavailable and yet they're stable they're not reactive or oxidizing as john kemp would say so um yeah there are some principles to that and one of them is what we call the stability constant which is kind of the ability or the affinity if you like of a metal iron to a chelator and how um, the, the efficiency of that chelation process but also the order because different metal ions like copper and iron and stuff um, do actually chelate um, in a different sequence depending on the chelation uh, agent. So there's, it's what we call a stability constant. So that's relatively easy to look up, but it is important, especially when you're doing um, chelates in pH, different pH waters and there's different other minerals in the water potentially. So you just got to be aware of that one. Uh, and yeah, the, this pH of water and there's other things in the water and the solubility of any salts that you're trying to put in the water and break apart so you can chelate them. All of that stuff comes into it. So just being aware of some of those principles is important for chelating. There's a bit of a toe and foot going out on some cane in North Queensland. Uh, and uh, yeah, if, I guess just a summary based on those principles of, of making all the different biologicals and that is... Um, use quality ingredients. That's the first thing. Whether it's you know high grade uh, chemical compounds or it's good a good culture, um, use quality ingredients. Um, the second thing is follow a consistent process, um, and then the third thing is using the correct equipment and clean equipment. Keep things clean and quality control. So here here we are just testing a batch of a biofert to see the pH has dropped. So yeah, just try to set yourself up some quality control mechanisms to make sure you're getting a consistent, reliable product each time. Because you are making on farm, but you do want it to be the best you can make it because you've spent the money and effort to get it there as well. Um, so now what I want to do is just jump into a couple of basic recipes and show you the little manual that we've cooked up, um, which is just a first version. We're really hoping to expand this manual and tap into a whole lot more recipes that people are trying and using with success and, and actually do some R&D around those recipes too. That's really our long-term goal uh, that when I say our Sawland food, along with uh, Dr. Chandra Iyer there at Green Microbes, we're really keen to try and help help you guys uh, build build the, what's the word, uh, v validate these recipes and yeah, so we can all improve them and make them the best they can. So I'm just gonna cover off on a couple of them and that is um, the base cultures, a couple of base cultures, uh, compost inoculants and hydrolysates. I'll touch on, show a few, one of them and then the biofertilizers. So I'll just grab that manual, just bear with me everyone because I, um, yeah, I forgot to open it this morning and have it ready for you, but. We'll just get it ready now. Hopefully it'll work. There we go. I'll zoom it in. So hopefully everyone can see that. Oh, so I saw one question in there. Sorry. Uh, James has put in there, being very new to regenerative ag two years in, my big question is how do you know what to put on? Yeah, James, that's a pretty big question, mate. So I guess the thing is it's like it's just good good common sense agronomy, James. I guess what you're doing is you're diagnosing the soil. Uh, you're going through a process basically um, to determine what your soil constraints are, but then you're also going through a process of evaluating the plants and the crop performance through either t tissue and sap testing, or visual symptoms, and then, then deciding, right, oh, um, what are my weak links and what type of product and when should I apply it? So yeah, I guess it is 
that is a big question you've put in there, but it's basically following a, a holistic agronomy approach, if I can put it in a nutshell. Um, so, uh, yeah, I might come back and try and answer it a bit better later on, but hopefully that's given you a bit of food for thought. So this is a bit of a manual that we've done up. Um, if I can get it to work, I've just got to work out how I can make that scroll down and up. There we go. So, yeah, um, that's Fraser's Pogues uh, putting out a bit of gear there. Um, down in north central victoria but basically yeah, what we've tried to do with this is just put together a number of simple recipes so there are lots of recipes out there and i know some of the guys watching this um, are making other products that are with success and 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 really getting into it and this manual is just a starter and we're hoping to really expand on it as we get some resources and time which are always the challenge um, but basically yeah it's got a bit of info and there's where's at a workshop we ran but i'll just get to the recipe so bear with me a minute um so we've got the uh first recipes of the base cultures and here's scotty with a, a, a brew of the base lacto culture from cab serum so the base cultures are these um really important kind of uh starters that you use to make other products so kind of you have to make your your target microorganisms that's what you you then have to culture them up or feed them to grow their numbers if you like so there are a number of base cultures but if we're talking talking about fermenting which is the main focus of this one is is fermenting in in sealed low oxygen no oxygen environments then then the base cultures are quite specific they're they're a group of yeast and lactobacillus type family microbes um, that do the job for you in a fermentation so um, there's a couple of different recipes with the base cultures and the two probably ones that we work with the most is the rice culture which is where you soak the rice in water as you can see there in that picture and then you take the water because the water's actually got a lot of those lactose in it because the lactose were living on the rice or on wheat or on cereals there's lactose all over the place and so you're grabbing them into water and then you feed them a bit of milk and that curdles and then from there that's a culture so you can add molasses to it and then you can use that in other brews so the other the other main cultures people use in this regard to make the ferments are, are paunch or manure from cows so that came out of the South Americans, the mass humus mob, um, who were using them a lot. And I did that training in 2011, and the guys were right into the manures when we did the course. Um, manures, uh, I guess the, there's an argument that manures are more diverse, but I guess the other side to it is if the cow isn't really optimum in health, then you might have a fairly ordinary culture coming out of the manure. Um, and the other challenge with those manures is that you can have a lot of suspended solids that are then problematic as you're handling and making your product and you've got to filter it and all of that. So that's the challenge with them. So one of the things you can do is to um, um, actually uh, get those into a slurry. So make a slurry with your manure and then screen it before you use it so rather than chucking the whole paunch or the manure into the brews and getting a lot of the associated solids with it you can actually just slurry it and then screen filter it and use the slurry that's been screened and it might save you a bit of headache but yeah there's different ways to deal with it so that's the the lab culture sorry everyone i'll just get this thing to work uh, and then the second culture which chandra dr chandra i kind of put us on to when we visited him a few years ago was using a kefir or a european yogurt so they're called kefir um, so we just call it cab serum so cab is in uh, kefir lacto labs here lacto bacillus um, so kefir based ones and there are different products there's one from scandinavia called phil milk which i used to drink when i lived in sweden and yeah those ones uh, they can make a really good culture because they've got a really good spectrum of microbes in it but they've also got a consistent amount of microbes because the dairy companies have to make sure that their products have a good quantity in it because they put it on the bottle so they have to make sure it actually is in there so we've found that it's a really good uh, base product it seems to make really consistent ferments um, quickly it saves your time 
there's no suspended solids. So at the moment we're trying to we're just start in the process of getting some DNA testing done on different starter cultures, but it it'll be a bit of a process. So you've got your starter cult cultures, and yeah, there's the recipes there. But basically, once you've got your starter cultures, the next thing is really about making different products from it and one product you can make is compost inoculum i won't spend too much time on that because not everyone is interested in making compost fermented compost but you can make an inoculum by adding that culture with other ingredients and it turns it into uh, this type of product as you can see in the picture there and that quite orangey brown color and that's an inoculum you can spray on your compost heap and then it will help you ferment through a fermentation process make compost and so I won't go into that anymore. Um, but let's get to some of the really important ones for, say, cropping and uh, grazing where you're making liquids and spraying it on. And the first of these is the hydrolysates. So a hydrolysate is basically just a high protein ferment. So that's really what the word hydrolysate means. Basically, it means high protein material that's been broken down by enzymes. That's probably its technical definition. So you can make hydrolysates by just buying enzymes and chucking them in with fish and it'll just break it down. But that's not microbially done. When you get microbes to do it, they break it down with all their enzymes. But what the, during the fermentation process, you get a whole lot of byproducts formed. So you get a whole lot of what we would call biomolecules like enzymes, organic acids, and there's a mountain of research all around the world that shows that these things have stress and health benefits to plants. They're biostimulants. And so when you make a hydrolysate, so whether it's on fish or food scraps or whatever, meat, um, there's amino acids are made. That's another thing that's made. And there's a huge amount of work showing that these things can have really positive benefits for plant health and plant stress management. So hydrolysates are a really high potential, exciting kind of area, I guess, of agronomy. And they can be made on farm pretty simply. So um, you can see here this simple recipe this is just with fish but it's just fish a starter culture we usually use cab um, molasses for the energy for the microbes obviously they need energy and food uh, and then clean water and pretty much you get your material you start a culture your molasses there's a certain ratio and you lock it up under a ferment so the hydrolysates um, are yeah amino acids are made organic acids a whole lot of things yeah that's definitely uh, one of the recipes um, to worth thinking about if you're thinking about getting into it and there are other recipes similar hydrolysate recipes on the web but again we've just put together this basic recipes that we know work they 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 come out good consistently each time the other main area of the um bioferments and stimulants so really hydrolysates are a biofertilizer if they've got they've got nutrients in them but they've also got the stimulatory effect and it's the same with some of the biofertilizers so the biofertilizers are where you add nutrients so here's a brew going at uh, Fraser's I think that is um, the biofertilizers are where we add we get a ferment going and we add nutrients to it I'll just chalk and stop and check the Q and A. Thanks for that, James. When it comes to stimulants, mate, you just got to overstimulate them. James' question is about how do you know how much of the stimulant to apply? So, James, it is a little bit of a black art, but that's agronomy. Agronomy is a black art, but the reality is that there's been quite a lot of studies showing that there's a certain threshold with stimulants over which you're not getting any stimulatory effect. So, usually, people apply these type of products around the five to 10 liters to the hectare. Um, and there has been quite a, quite a few studies done even on, not on all compounds, but on some of these stimulant compounds that yeah, over that you, you don't get any extra benefit or you don't get, you can actually get an inhibitive effect. So there has been some work showing that on some things like chitin, for example, which some people use like a chitin based product that, that over a certain amount of chitin, it actually inhibits uptake because the, the pores on the plant get, get blocked. So yeah, usually it's around that five to 10 liters to give you that rough rate. There's something in chat. 
uh, Liz has put into chat, does the hydrolysate fermentation process smell? Liz, when you make a hydrolysate, you're locking it down under no oxygen with a one-way valve. So obviously, um, like here on the picture here on this uh, big tank, you can see the one-way valve, the water bottle hanging off the side there. So the methane that's generated, because that's the gas, and if there's any other smelly gases like so, um, the hydrogen sulfide and stuff, those gases come out and they bubble through that water. But if you do it, so it's a locked system, so you shouldn't get any odor at all. And when the product is finished, if it has been through a true ferment and it's fully fermented, it should sell, smell quite stable and neutral to slightly sweet. Even fish or even, I've got a pig ferment on pig carcasses sitting in my front garden for two years and it did get a little bit unstable and start to smell when I opened the lid so I put a bit more molasses in it and it stabilized it again so a true a well-made ferment should be neutral to slightly sweet it shouldn't have a strong odor um, and that's the difference for example to um, Charlie Carp and some of these other uh, emulsions where they just smash it up and they might put phosphoric acid in it to stabilize it or they might pasteurize it to stabilize it, they still will have quite a smell. But having said that, you can make a really high concentration product um, that has a little bit of an ammonia smell to it if it's got a lot of nitrogen in it. But ideally, you shouldn't be smelling that because that would tell you that all the nitrogen's been complexed and is now stable in an, in an organic complexed form so hopefully that gives you a bit of an answer um, to that one okay so i'll keep going because i'm mindful that i'm going to run out of time probably hopefully everyone's getting something from it uh, so yeah your hydrolysate so your biofertilizer sorry so the biofertil the principle of the biofertilizer is that you have your nutrient elements that you want to get into a more bioavailable form and you add them to a ferment and that changes the form of your nutrient element um, into a more biological form because the microbes digest it and chelate it. You can also obviously make straight chelates where we just get a chelation agent like um, uh, citric acid or EDTA or some, uh, and then we add the nutrient and the chelation agent in pure water and it kind of complexes it without biology. So you can chelate nutrients letting the microbes do it in a ferment or you can chelate just with pure uh, organic chelators and no microbes involved and they've both got their place I'd suggest to you and I know some of the guys in South Australia are doing a lot of chelates and so, and then also some biological products and we had a pretty good brainstorm around okay well what's the sort of most efficient way to do all of this sort of stuff um, but here's the, the, the basic recipes in the manual and that you see online and stuff basically we're adding a culture we're adding an energy source we're adding some nutrients for the microbes and then we're also adding our key nutrient elements that we want to be in the brew so that when we spray it out, I'm chasing calcium or phosphorus, then I have enough of them in there to help me with my phosphorus needs because that's what I'm worried about at the moment if phosphorus is my problem. So there's a few recipes in here. This one here is the, uh, a, a P one. So we've just put a little bit more phosphorus in it than maybe normally with the idea that the phosphorus can get kind of uh, complexed or chelated by the microbes, they can digest it uh, and then they can um, stabilize that phosphorus in a bioavailable form that'll be really friendly for the soil system around the roots, um, but it may also get taken up directly by the plant through the tissue. There's another question's come in there, so I better get it, James. Uh, yep, great, yeah. Uh, trichos are used here too, James, for sure. So, you yeah, know, a lot of people add trichos in, in the brew um, and get them going for sure to try and improve the trichoderma around the root zone. Yep, definitely. Um, so, um, yeah, so that's the that's a pea recipe. Um, and if you are looking at this, uh, and we can, this is freely available, this recipe book and all that, we can get it to you by email. Sorry, I'm just getting this thing to work. 
um, yeah, the way we get phosphorus in this one is we use something called MKP, monopotassium phosphate, which is a kind of high concentrated phosphorus product, uh, MKP. So it doesn't have nitrogen. So sometimes people might use MAP with the ammonium in it, but we try to avoid too much nitrogen in these brews because um, the concern is that it will disrupt the culture. So these are still kind of lessons that we've really got to learn, I guess, how much nitrogen we can put into these brews, soluble nitrogen and not disrupt them, uh, how much phosphorus we can actually add to our ratio of energy and culture because it's all about the ratios. If I have this much culture, this many microbes and this much energy and nutrients for them, how much phosphorus can they actually digest and how much phosphorus is just sitting there that they can't eat because they don't have enough energy and nutrients to eat that much phosphorus. All of these things is what we're trying to work out. And the problem is it's not black and white chelation or solubility rules. When you're talking about microbial culturing, it gets a lot more complex. So um, the good news is, you know, there are tests you can do, but it just takes time to sort of ground truth all that, I guess. So yeah, so that's a recipe there. Um, I'll keep going down, it's a mindful of time. There's another recipe there for, and this is a thousand litre scale. There's another recipe in there for, sorry, everyone, I'll get that back, for calcium. So just a, a product with a bit more calcium in it. Um, and um, again, same process, but deciding on which form of calcium to add into the brew. If you add in a micronized lime, even if it's really finely ground, it's still problematic about getting it broken down by the microbes um, in time, I guess. So, um, or all of it getting broken down. So can I use a, a, a truly soluble calcium? Again, remembering you've got your solubility rule. So I need to, microbes like stuff, bacteria like stuff that's really simple and soluble. They like red cordial, that's the reality. So if you give them red cordial, they're happy, they eat it really quickly. So can we put calcium in there in a form that's really soluble so they digest it really quickly? Um, and But we don't want to put it in, in a, a calcium salt that might disrupt the other dynamics of the culture. So you've got calcium chloride and that again, we've put in there calcium thiosulfate because I remember Arden Anderson many years ago um, and Dr. Fred Woods, who's a technical guy from the US, the company I used to work for there, Osmin, um, that's where we got some of our technical training from those two guys for the products. Um, and they, yeah, he, calcium thiosulfate was the preferred one because it's, it's more, I guess, biologically friendly in cultures. So yeah, you're thinking about your solubility rules. You're thinking about your culturing rules. So again, learning those trades and going, all right, what's an effective way to culture up here? There's another Q and A's come in. So I better just check that. Uh, yeah, James, it's available, mate. No worries. So either through the big no-till guys or give it to Dan or just contact us direct at Soil Land Food. It's all good. Um, yeah, so that's a calcium focused product. And I guess finally, um, the other one that we've got in, in this recipe book, which we just chucked in here, because some people want an all in one. This is just a multi mineral one where we've put, it's got quite a few trace minerals or micronutrients in it as well. So it's slightly different recipe with more spectrum of trace elements. Um, and so I guess the key thing, so this is, there's lots of other recipes out there. And I think probably, I'll just go back to my slide. Probably the key, one of the key things to think about is if I'm trying to put out trace elements in a bioavailable form, is chelation a more efficient way to do that than fermenting? And it could well be that it is. Uh, and then you make your ferment for your biological and stimulant values and you can just tank mix them before applying them. So can if I'm chasing a particular trace element, maybe the most efficient way to get a high concentration of it in a, in a chelated bioavailable form is through chelation, straight chelation. So I have my chelated product in a, in a um, shuttle and then in another shuttle, I have my stimulant product. Uh, it may be a good way to do it. It may not. It may not be because the biologically fermented chelated way might actually it just trigger that uptake more efficiently, or really trigger genetic expression, 
it's, there's so many interactions going on. So I guess it's, you know, it's a little bit about trial and, and watching, but um, that's definitely one of the questions I have anyway around this whole space. And I think we had it, yeah, in South Australia at the field day, we had a bit of a brainstorm around that because I think it's still a question we need to ask ourselves. Um, so yeah, that's just a couple of the recipes, but basically if you're using paunch or manure or you're going to get microbes out of the scrub and a few places on your farm, you're basically getting base cultures. And then you can use those base cultures to make a whole range of products, whether it be hydrolysates, biofertilizers, Korean natural farming recipes, you name it. But they kind of fall into um, four or five categories. They're either going to be hydrolysates, fertilizers, or other, or or just an inoculant batch. You just want a batch of your inoculant. You're trying to culture up an inoculant. Um, hopefully, you're not trying to culture up something from a commercial company. No, I'm just kidding. I'll, I'm sure that there's some of that going on. Uh, but just remember though, when you're culturing that what you feed them will select or filter your culture. So if you have a culture that's used to living on this kind of food and then you chuck a bit different food in, you may well shift the culture. So, um, you know, we, we, we're, we're hoping to do some DNA tests on these communities under these different recipes, but I have seen a DNA test on a culture and when they added biochar into the culture, because they did different recipes, it increased the diversity of the culture big time, just a bit of biochar. So you can sort of see what we feed the microbes can shift the culture. And so I think we've got to be really mindful of that as we're making these products. Um, so just some practical tips before I pull it up. Um, use clean water, make some slurries. I mentioned that before. Use fresh manure from a healthy cow if you're going to use manure. Um, food safety issues. If you're in horticulture and you've got food safety auditors that are really, 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 really particular, then you're going to have to show them that it's safe and, you know, you're going to have to deal with that. Um, use, very, use soluble or very fine nutrient elements. Probably soluble is best when you're culturing because the microbes love that stuff. It's easy for them to assimilate and the problem with some of the micronized stuff is they may not be able to digest it in time. Try and avoid chloride and nitrate forms of nutrients when you're doing your solubility, you know, dissolving stuff. But I'm sure it's probably okay to use some of them, but just be mindful of it, I guess, is the key thing. Uh, filtering things, store in clean containers, all the basic common sense stuff. Keep sealed and cooled and regularly check your products if you're keeping them for a while. So um, last couple of slides and then I'll pull it up. Got a question there. Oh, sorry, I've already answered that for James. So anyway, um, I'll keep going. Sorry, everyone. Uh, yeah, the, I guess the key thing about using these bioferments and stimulants is that the products are supporting the soil plant system. They're not magic bullets. They're only one part of an integrated approach. But the key thing, I guess, is we live in the 21st century using our modern, up-to-date understanding of soils and plants. They are completely interwoven with a microbiome and they talk to each other in all of these amazing ways through these biomolecules, what we call chemical signaling. So it's kind of like this hidden dimension of 5G going on a bit like now, wherever you are in Australia, there's all these five and 4G wavelengths sending messages all over the planet. You know, someone's just had their, like they spilled their coffee. So they send a message on Facebook, whatever it is, there's all this stuff going on that we just can't see that influences us every day and it's the same in this paddock there's all these dimensions of communication that if you're not open to it you've got no idea but it's real and it's modifying the plant it's modifying the soil and it's been going on for hundreds of millions of years so we're trying to support and enhance that process so basically, Telstra should come in and help us with this agronomy. No, I'm just kidding. They're probably not the people to come in. All right, last couple of slides. So it's important to apply the products using a sound agronomic decision-making process. Uh, and I won't go too much into the using them apart from that sort of five to 10 litres because it, it is a whole topic in itself. And I think it's probably a good topic for another day, Dan, with a couple of users, a couple of farmers and really have a good discussion around that. But yeah, it is a whole topic. So I'll leave that one for now. Suffice to say, you can spray it to the soil or you can, around the root zone or you can obviously spray it as a foliar. 
Um, but when you're using them, you know, what are you trying to achieve? This is pineapple grower in North Queensland that has, re has to a great extent been able to control really nasty soil borne diseases with compost tea, but it took them a long time to work that out. But that's what they were trying to achieve, biocontrol of a really, really bad uh, soil borne disease that was hammering the pineapples. You know, if I'm using them with other products in the tank, are they compatible? What rates am I going to go in? Should I do foliar or soil? And what's the timing? What time of year, what time of the crop cycle is the right time to apply these things to get the result that I'm aiming for? Um, you know, and that's the thing. Here's, here's a dairy in Finland. There's Luke in the background with the young fella. Um, you know, they're using these things on pastures at key times to help prime pasture growth and root development. So it's just thinking through what and why, what you're trying to achieve, what agronomic goals, problems you're trying to solve. Uh, and I guess monitoring the effects of them through tissue and sap testing. Here's a lychee grower, Mal Everett, who's really big on his sap and tissue tests, crops, crop responses, soil responses, and obviously the economics. Are you spending less of your inputs to get the result? Uh, and I'll leave you with one of the trials we did back in the day with the compost tea product that I was uh, lucky enough to learn on the job from back in the first generation of biologicals. Uh, and this was a corn crop where we put out, I think it was five or 10 litres of the compost tea product on corn. We lowered the, the NPK fertiliser in the program. And yeah, we got a really, really interesting, impressive result. You can see Jules, the R&D coordinator that worked with me, um, showing the two sides. He's in the middle of the paddock. It's a side-by-side -side trial. And yeah, the biological, in that situation, the biological definitely gave an agronomic and economic response. It was uh, quite interesting at quite a low rate on a very heavy soil. But it is a new area of technology and you don't always get the result you think you're going to get. So it's all about trying to learn why. Why did we get a result there so we can learn for next time? Uh, and on that note, I'll pull it up. Um, and here's a broccoli trial we did where you can see the, the time to wilting in the crop was a lot less where the biological wasn't a pride. But don't ask me why, but anyway, we could definitely see the wilting come in quicker on the NPK side as opposed to the biological side. Dan, I'm going to leave hand it over to you. There's one last question there, which probably from James. No, Steve. Steve, I knew you were going to ask me a hard one. How long should we allow for microbial digestion of minerals? My rule of thumb, mate, is about four weeks, but um, just to allow that full, because it's going to depend a bit on if it's truly soluble, the nutrient, and they've got enough energy. So they're pretty quick, as you know, um, and you'll know when they've run through, run their race because you won't get that off-gassing anymore. So you know at that point, whatever they've digested, they've digested. So they've either run out of energy or they've run out of substrate to digest so a nutrient substrate. So, yeah, I think I, I kind of, the rule of thumb I have is eight weeks, but Jerry Gillespie um, and Chandra will probably say you could do it shorter than that and you probably can, but it's going to depend a little bit on the concentration of your energy and your nutrients a bit. Um, sorry to not give you a black and white answer, mate. All right, Dan, thanks for that. No, very good. Great presentation, Dave. Um, certainly get a lot out of out of listening to you every time I listen to you speak. So um, really appreciate you joining us today. I know how busy you are. Um, it's a ever increasing, increasingly popular space, this bioferments. And um, obviously that's reflected in how busy you are at the moment with everyone wanting to pull you here, there and everywhere. So Really appreciate you um, yeah, fitting us in this morning. Um, I'm sure everyone's got a lot out of it, obviously, with the amount of questions and comments and stuff that we've had. Um, so, and it's, you know, got a lot out of your presentation in terms of how scalable these things are. Um, you can, you know, you can see that, you know, you can do them in milk containers in your backyard or you can do them in 9,000 litre tanks. Um, you know, it's, and that's, that's the beauty of your recipes that they are quite scalable and, and they can fit the size of your farm. So um, I, I think yeah. it's a, that's one of the challenges, isn't it? Keeping it simple as we can, but getting a quality product, but keeping it as simple as we can, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, and that simplicity, I think, comes down to, um, you know, in my experience, going to collect manure and, and mm -hmm. filtering it all and that sort of thing. It takes a long, long time, but um, really like like the idea of using, using Kefra as a base, it, you know, to make it scalable, you need to make it easy and, and for people to, 
to adapt it. So, um, yeah. I think, um, you know, hats off to you and, and your team, you know, with your, um, yeah, trialling of, of all this sort of stuff to make it easier for farmers so that, you know, it is, um, yeah, more likely to be adopted. So, yeah, I um, know. Oh, no, there's plenty of people. Hats off to you guys for <laughs> risking it out in the paddock. But, yeah, Chandra, Chandra and me are really keen to support everyone. So, you know, we're, we're well, obviously he's busy too, but we are really keen. So we're, we're working on it. I'd really like to get a manure-based, you know, simple recipe and a kefir-based one and just do a DNA comparison and go, what is the difference? So it'd be interesting to see. But... Yeah, yeah. No, very good. So, right, um, eh? I think that was a uh, question was asked about the recipe book. Um, yeah, it's obviously available through you, David. Or I think. Yep. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's a PDF. I'll I'll send it to you. But we've we've got it. If people want it, they can just email us at the website, and we'll send it through to them. No worries. Yep. No, that's the easiest way to, to go about it. I think so. No, nah, another another great webinar. Big thanks to Wimmera CMA and the Land Care um, through the funding through the National Land Care Program. Um, really. Thankful for your support to make this all happen. happen. Um, some ha housekeeping before we wrap up. The uh, the uh, recording of this uh, webinar will be up on our YouTube channel. So if you want to go over it and have a look again, um, or if you know someone that missed the webinar and um, wants to go back and look at it, yeah, you can find it on our YouTube channel. Um, the next uh, webinar will be back with Graham Hand again, uh, talking about rotational grazing. So. Uh, have a look for the link and, and the advertisement for that. Um, if you haven't registered, um, yeah, do so before next week. Um, there will be a survey that comes up in your window when, when the webinar is finished. So if you could fill that out, that would be much appreciated. It just helps us make the webinars better and, and uh, part of our reporting back to the CMA. Um, so if you could do that, much appreciated. Um, so that's about it from me. Thank you very much for everyone for coming. Um, I think it's been a great session. I'm just having a look here. There seems to be a couple more questions. Do we want to fill them in? Dave, have you got time to fill them? Yeah, no in worries. Before What's... we finish. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay, so James has got a question there about eff efficacy of biostimulates in a healthy soil. Yeah. Uh, Definitely, James, if your soil's healthy and the plants are growing really well, then it's better to go fishing than worry about adding anything more, mate. That's my opinion. But I guess it's a question of how healthy and what, what you mean by that. Like, is it, are there still some missing links? So, yeah, I, I think it's good to question it if it's the soil's already healthy, for sure. Do I really need to add anything more? Um, definitely, I think it's a good question. And Steve's got in there, where can we send the sample? So, uh we're still working on that steve we have identified like obviously there's the soil dna dna lab metagen which we start we've been we've been using for a couple of years and they do soil sample dna which is really good but we're just working on whether they can help us with the liquids uh and if not chandra's identified a couple of other um, liquid places that can do liquids so um, yeah the one that I that we that we did as part of another project was sent through the University of Queensland so we're just trying to fine-tune that and getting a cheap one one that's not too expensive because metagen's pretty cheap but they don't they mainly do soil so we're working on working on it Steve but as soon as I get a known you know good place to do it I'll let you guys know for sure very good. We might leave it there. Um, yep. A little bit past the eight o'clock, so appreciate you sticking on though for a little bit. No longer. worries. Thanks uh, for having me. I think we'll have to. We're only just scratching the surface. We'll have to get you back for another one. So sounds good. So, nah. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, David. Thanks for no worries. Thanks, Dan. Care, so appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thank you very much. See ya.